All right, welcome back. We're still doing lesson three. <clears throat> we're still talking about contracts. And now we're going to talk about the validity of a contract and what can make it valid, what can make it avoidable. And sometimes when there is something that is not even a contract, and probably this is going to be... Um, one of these topics is going to move with a bullet into my top five pet peeves. And uh, for those of you that know me out there know that I do often number my pet peeves and will probably hit all five of them, uh, at least professional pet peeves before we get done uh, with this class. And this is quickly making its way into the top five. So we'll talk about that. But when a contract, things that can affect, affect the validity of the contract, things that can make the contract actually uh, valid. So first of all, we need to discuss this term about what is called an express contract. An express contract is a contract in w which both parties' actions are actually spelled out. It is not qu of question of law because it is defined within the contract itself. Our listing agreements are express contract. It expressly, no pun intended, states that the listing agent will in fact market the property to bring a sufficient number of buyers or exposures to the uh, deal that they will uh, diligently uh, you know, have open houses and market the property and expose it to the public to uh, help the seller get more people to the, the property. Uh, actually just lost my brain there for a minute. Whereas it also explains what the seller will do. It will say, you know, that he will be truthful and honest about the condition of the property. He will allow uh, the listing agent to market the property. Uh, he will allow showings in the property and viewings. So it is an express contract insofar as both parties know what they are supposed to do because it is expressly stated in the body of the contract itself. All right. Now contrast that with what we call an implied contract. An implied contract is where one party or the other know their job and it is not expressly, no pun intended, stated in the contract what they do. All right, so let me give you a good example. When you go out to dinner or out to eat with your business colleagues or your wife or your children and you have a nice dinner and when you're finished with the dinner, you get up to go walk out before you leave, what is the last thing you do? You actually pay for the meal, all right? At least I hope you do. <laughs> if you don't, then that's a whole other contract and we're not gonna talk about that. But you pay for the meal, right? Now, why are you doing this? There is nothing written on the wall. There's no poster that says, we'll provide you with a healthy meal. You provide us with compensation. There is nothing on the menu that you sign saying, we'll feed you, you pay us. Because the contract of service for lunch is an implied contract. They provided you with a product and a service, and now you will compensate them for that product, but it is not written down in any kind of express manner that says that you inherently know your position or your activities inside of this contract because that is the social norm or the social, I don't want to use the word contract there, but you get the point. Your section or your side or your obligation of that deal was inherent to you and you didn't have to have it written down. Now, we don't work in implied contracts. We actually have one that has probably burned you at least once in your career, and if it hasn't, it will eventually, because the buyer's agency, when we don't have them sign 
an exclusive buyer's agency contract. We just start working with them. That is implied agency, and that can get you burned, all right? Once again, follow the logic. You do not have a buyer sign an express buyer's agency, or we call it a buyer's agency agreement, which is an express contract because it explains to them what they do and what you do. Instead, you think, well, it's my neighbor's brother's sister's kid. I trust him. He trusts me. I don't need a contract. I'll just start showing him properties, and I hope he does the right thing. That is the implied portion of this. I will show him properties. He will use me to write the offer. As we all know, that doesn't always happen. And then we're left holding the bag and we're like, you know, why didn't I uh, get to be the buyer's agent on that? I think he owes me a commission. Because you were working under an implied agency and your assumption was that the buyer was going to use you to write the offer and you thought that was inherently knowledgeable and maybe it was or it wasn't with that buyer. All right? That's why you want to create that express agency so that it specifically says, hey, I get paid when you write this offer. So now let's get into my uh, pet peeves and we'll talk about this. And uh, one of those other misnomers that we often discuss. So when a contract is formed, it is deemed to be a valid contract. It is valid, remember, if all five parts of the contract are in place. You know, it's a legal promise, it's a legal activity, there's compensation, there is a, uh, a legal objective, and there's uh, an agreement to do something but voluntary between the parties. If all five parts of a contract are in place, it is said to be a valid contract. Now, I hope all of your contracts you ever deal with are valid in nature. So here comes the next one. There is a word called void, and if you will notice in the notes and in the workbook, we use the word void agreement. Because technically, a, contra a void is not even a contract from the get-go. All right? A void contract differs from a voidable contract because while a void contract is one that was never legally valid to begin with, it was never enforceable at any point in the future either because it is never even a contract. If you go back and look, I use the word agreement. Because void is never a contract at all. It never even was a contract. It is completely missing one of the elements. What I mean by that is, if I said, hey, look, I'll wash your car today, yes or no, that contract is oral, and if you agreed to it, it would not have been a contract by definition because it's completely missing the element of compensation. I just said, I will wash your car today, yes or no. And you said yes. Well, unfortunately, that contract was missing an element altogether. So it is never voidable. It was le not even legally valid from the get-go because it doesn't define a contract. Now, contract, contrast that with this other term called voidable. All right? Voidable is a contract that looks valid, but upon inspection... One of the five parts may be defective. Remember, there's five parts to the contract. And you go through and go, yeah, voluntary agreement. There's compensation. There are legal age. It's for a legal objective. And then the acknowledgement is signed by my vice president of operations, Olivia Modulin. Well, you find out Olivia Modulin is only 17. 
Therefore, that signature that you see on this finger quotes contract actually is defective. So it potentially can be undone as opposed to the other one never even was a contract from the get-go, all right? So a void is completely missing a part. It is, it is, never was, and never will be enforceable on any party because it never was a contract. And I hear agents all the time that go, well, this contract's null and void. No, it's not. It's voidable, meaning it can be undone. It's not automatically undone. Void is uh, never a contract. Voidable could be enforceable even though it looks or may be defective. It could still be enforceable. It would have to be active actions to get it undone. Another good example would be you sign a contract with somebody and they come back later and go, hey, dude, I was actually out of my mind at that particular time in my life. I don't remember signing this contract. Uh, I want to get it undone, all right? So it is enforceable currently because he did not declare that he was mentally incompetent and now he's trying to use that. We may have to have a court decide if he was mentally incompetent at the time. You know, it may require doctors, uh, affidavits. It may require somebody else saying, yes, I was his caretaker. It may require proof from a pharmacy that says, yes, he was on medicine. But until then, that contract is enforceable. So when somebody says, hey, the uh, contract's null and void, it net, that's not true because there's no such thing as a void contract. It's avoidable, meaning it could be undone. Void means it never was a contract to begin with. And then the last one is called an unenforceable contract. So if I said, hey, look, I'll wash your car today for $20. Do you agree? And you say yes sir, and yes, we would have, in fact, a contract in place. It may be oral, but it is definitely a legal contract. However, the problem with this is that that contract could be unenforceable meaning the judge cannot force me to wash your car. You might get me in some other fashion and say, hey, look, now my feelings are hurt and I want reparations and I'm suing for pain and suffering. That's a whole different issue. But an unenforceable, he can't force me to wash your car. He could bill me some money or fine me in a court of law for something but the contract is only valid between you and I because we are the only two that will benefit from this contract or probably actually even know about the contract. So therefore, it's said, often said to be valid between the parties, meaning the contract's only good between you and I. No one else is going to get involved. No one else can get involved. And certainly no one else can force an issue to make sure the contract is executed. If I decide to wash the car and you pay me the 20 bucks, then it was a valid contract, right? It's only valid between you and me. If I decide not to wash the car, the judge can't step in the middle and go, no, Raymond, you wash the car. Dude, try and make me wash your car and see what happens. All right. So we're still here in the uh, third lesson. We're still dealing with contracts. We've probably got uh, a lot more time here when dealing with these contracts. So stick around. Uh, we're taking care of your required post-licensing 30-hour course. I'm Raymond Modulin. Please go to facebook.com slash realuniversity. Give us a thumbs up, and we'll see you here in just a few more minutes.